summary of what we look at today, perfect sign for uh, for where we're going to be at in Ephesians chapter 4 again, working our way through just a real quick, uh, real quick review for you. And in our study of Ephesians, which this is the 39th week that we've been in, uh, we came through the first three chapters that talk about uh, our position in Christ. These last four talk about our practice. There's a lot of different ways to look at it. Ultimately, if you boil them right down, you've got three chapters of theology, and then you've got four, five, and six that tell us how to really put all of that theology out. Uh, and that's what brings it right into talking about, uh, about how to live out our faith. That's ultimately uh, what Paul's instructing. Remember, this is a Gentile church that he's writing to. They're, they're made up of Gentiles, and so they need to be rooted and grounded in the Word of God. And so that's why you have those first three chapters of that theology. And now it's not really this one, so he's telling them how to live this all out in their lives. So what we looked at last week, we were, I'm going to read these verses for you here in a moment, was Paul's call for these believers to basically to move on in their spiritual growth, to, to move forward in their spiritual growth. And what he does is, whenever he comes to verse 17, he presents to them a negative. And, and, and he uses this negative to speak to them. Watch verse 17, uh, 17 to 19. Here's what he says. This is what we looked at last week. It says, This I say, therefore, and testify the Lord, that she makes sure here comes the, here comes the negative. The Gentiles walk, not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of the vanity of the mind, having the understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God, to be aggressive to them, because of the blindness of their hearts, to be in bad feeling, of giving themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all that famous with greediness. So, what he does here, he uses this negative to talk about what the unsaved world is like. And we broke that down last week, and, and we talked about the fact that it says that they, they live in a they live in a vanity of their in the vanity of their mind. In other words, the bottom line is this: that they're governed by the same nature, and they follow after the philosophies of the world. We were all like this; we did the very same thing. They follow after the philosophies of the world, and they in that vanity, they in its own emptiness. And they look for satisfaction and fulfillment as they, as they buy into what the world holds out, basically. That's the idea there. In verse 18, Paul says that their understanding has been darkened, which means this, that their moral compass is basically broken. And, and they, there are times whenever they struggle to even know what is right and what is wrong. He goes on to say, that they are alienated from the life of God. They're separated from God, so they, they have no direction from God. Neither do we. The Lord just describes us in the way that we used to be in our lives. But he's saying, look, well, this is how we used to be, but we, we don't go this direction anymore. We need to get away from this. And so they, they, they have their understanding part, and he goes on in this. He talks about, uh, at the end of verse 18, he says, that being alienated from the life of God to the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, their hearts are, the idea is there that their, their hearts are callous and they are, they are completely hardened and separated from God. And last week we talked about the fact that this is something that they have brought on themselves in their lives. Watch verse 19, that being past feeling have given themselves over. They've given themselves over, and God has also given them over. And I want to just go back over something here that we looked at last week to help you understand that in Romans 1, chapter, or chapter 1, verses 18 through 24, you see what happens to the unsaved world. Verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And you know, here comes hold the truth and unrighteousness. Suppress the truth. That they suppress the truth that God has given to them. Verse 
verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it unto them. The men of God manifest themselves in notable ways. One of the ways is right here, verse 20. For the invisible things of them from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even as eternal power of God had, so that they are without excuse. In other words, through creation, they know that God exists. They know that. And they also have a conscience. And they, they have the law written within their hearts. They know whenever, whenever as we grow up as from, from children into, into adults, we know because God has placed within us His own law written in our hearts, according to Romans chapter 2, that we know right and wrong. People know murder is wrong. They know stealing is wrong. They know lying is wrong because God has written His law within the heart. But what happens is when He goes on, he suppresses that truth, and so he hardens his own heart. And, and Paul goes on in Romans, and he says this, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, they were faithful, but became plain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was dark, and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible name of the birds and the four foot of beasts, and creeping things worse for God also. And we don't give them up to uncleanness and the loss of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So they, they have suppressed the truth of God. They've given themselves over and, and to a life of suppressing the truth and denying the revelation that there is a God that exists. And so therefore, God himself allows them in his wrath, and it says, if we could back you up here for a second and watch that first verse, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed. The idea there, the text is, it's being revealed. It's being revealed today. So these people are experiencing this today as part of the wrath of God upon their lives. And so they are, what's happening is they are caught up in, in what I call a downward spiritual spiral. Going about uh, watch verse 19 again of uh, chapter 4, watch what it says. You're being past feeling. Past feeling. That means unable to feel pain. Not in that physical pain, but unable to feel the convictions of the conscience because they have seared the conscience. And so they've gotten to the point where. Things don't bother me anymore. You, you will go out in the world today and you see people going back and doing things and you say to yourself, how in the world could somebody ever do that if it never seems to bother them? And the reason is, it's because they have seared their conscience. But watch what else. Watch for something again. Who being bad feeling has given themselves over to the serious and sets on pride and loss. That's what that means. Look at the lie she goes further. To work all uncleanness with greediness. What the world does that mean? It means this. That no matter how deep the darkness that they step into, the next time they step into that darkness, they want it to be deeper. They want it to be more daring. They're never satisfied to receive somebody that gets involved in sin and they, 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 they kind of go off on this journey and you wonder what in the world are they going? But what, the, what happens is, the understanding becomes darkened, and you can't, they cannot tell the, they, they lose focus uh, between the right and wrong, the moral purpose gets completely smashed to pieces, and, and they have no connection with God, their hearts, their heart is, is hardened, they know past feeling, they see the conscience, and they keep going, and, and every time they come, they seem to go just a little bit deeper, and they go deeper and deeper into immorality because there is that greediness, that's the sin nature that governs them. Okay, now, Paul had a hearing in all of this, and the morning was this, be careful we don't fall back into this. Be careful we don't go back into this. He says this in verse 17. He says, I trust them, trust the Father, the Lord, that you, that you, henceforth, walk not as over Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Don't you dare look with still have the same nature. Don't you dare go back to that. We've been set free from that. We're going to talk about that this morning. We've been set free from that. When Christ came, watch out of 1 John 3, 5, it says this, And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, 
Now look, don't think that that's just talking about taking sin off of your account. He did that. He went and he, he marked our account, paid in full with our sins, or removed from us as far as the east is from the west. But the idea here is this, that he was manifest to take away sin out of our lives so that we don't live in it anymore. That's the idea right here. Before you're saved, you look, you don't have an option. You, you, are, you are a slave to sin. Watch what Paul says in Romans 6, 20. He says, for when you were the servants of sin, that's what we used to be, servants of sin, he says you were free from righteousness. In other words, before we were saved, we could not order in, in any means produce anything that was righteous. Absolutely impossible. Absolutely impossible. Even if you did something that looked good, it wasn't good because your motive was wrong. The motive behind it was wrong. And so you couldn't, right here it says, you were free from righteousness. There is not one safe person in the world that can do any kind of righteous work whatsoever. Absolutely impossible because they are the servants of sin. The servants of sin. So, let me get you back to the thought here. So in, in verses 17, 18, and 19, if we take the unsaved Gentile world, if we take all the unsaved world, we could say this, they are controlled by the sin nature. Okay, now Paul gives a warning in all of this. He said, and, and the idea is that, that we do have that sin nature. We're going to talk about that. But we no don't, don't longer need to obey him. So, that brings me to where we're at today. I think I'm going to let's move forward. Part 2, but watch verse 20 now. He says this. There's a contrast. By me. Okay? 17, 18, and 19. Here you got these unseen Gentiles living by and, and under the control of sin, enslaved to sin, under the control of the, the flesh, the sin nature. Paul says, but you're different. That's what he's even about to say. We're not like that anymore. We're different. So I can go back to First John 3, uh, find a game back up there one more time. Jesus was manifest and take away our sins, taken out of our lives so that, so that we don't practice that life anymore. Okay, so I'm going to go on. Watch this. Uh, it's one again. But she has not so learned Christ. Now watch that he says, Watch what he doesn't say, is what I, the way I put it. He doesn't say that you have so learned about Christ, because I'm saying people can learn about Christ. That's not what he's saying at all. He says, but you have not so learned Christ. Now, why don't you got to connect verse 21 with it, and then you'll start to get it. Watch this. If so, be you that you have heard him, that's Jesus, and have been taught by him, his truth is in Jesus. So Paul says this to him. He says, look, that's not the way you're taught. You're taught differently. You're taught differently. And somebody might say, well, well, wait a minute. This is the early church. They don't have the completed scriptures. How are they taught? And it says here in, in verse 21, Paul says that they were taught, they heard him, and they've been taught by him. Now that was a listen. That was the person. He's not saying that you walk the face of the earth with them. No, no, no. That's not what he's saying. That they walk the face of the earth with Jesus. That's that's not what he's saying at all. He's saying that they are taught at all times by Christ. So are you and I. So are you and I. I'm going to get into something here today. I want you to know. follow along through this. But I'll start here. John 10, 27. Watch what Jesus said. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice. Now listen, we don't hear an audible voice of Christ. But here's, here's what happens. You and I, the moment that we are saved, we are given the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit indwells us. He indwells us. If, if somebody doesn't have the Spirit of God, then they're not saved. 
And I said, if somebody is not, let me go back to this, if somebody is not taught by Christ, do not say it. If, because Jesus teaches each and every one of us through the Spirit of God. He teaches each and every one of us that the Spirit of God, when every one of us has the Spirit of God, when we think not everyone is saved, I'll say it that way. It says this, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, and if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So we all have the Spirit of God living inside of us. So it is the Spirit of God that teaches and instructs you and I as to how we are to live our lives. I'm going to be in this. I'm going to get to the point where our responsibility is to make sure that we're tuned into Him. Because He wants to speak to us. Now, there's multiple ways He does it. He can do it to a sermon that I preach and He speaks directly to you. The Spirit of God gets in your life by something that I share with you and and he makes money to you, and hey, this needs to be adjusted, and that needs to be adjusted, and, and so he speaks to you. He can do it as you read the Word of God. He can do it while you're just out about, or, or you're having quiet time with him, and you're just, instead of saying too much, you're just sitting there, and you're just allowing God to minister to your spirit. You can bring things to your thoughts. But the Spirit of God works within us. Watch John 16. 13 or 14. How be it, Jesus, baby, how be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall be here, so he's going to be, he's going to be given things to speak, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now, watch verse 14. <laughs> he shall glorify me. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive a one, and, and, and shall show it unto you. Now, let me go back to those four words. He shall glorify me. Now, listen to me. When, when you and I walk in a way that we are controlled by the Spirit of God, let me tell you what's going to happen. People are going to see Christ in you because the Spirit of God's mission is to glorify Jesus. And so if I'm living in a way that, that I am controlled by the Spirit of God, then I can be sure of this, that in my life people are going to see Jesus Christ. So we're given the Spirit of God to teach us how to live. Let me go to uh, 1 John 2. <coughs> Excuse me. 20 and 21 and verse 27. Says, but you have an option from the Holy One. That's an anointing. Okay, that's what that means. You've been anointed from God. You have an anointing from God. But you know, watch this. But you have an option from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written on you because you know not the truth, but because you know it. And you know the lies of the truth. But the anointing which you have received of Him, which is abideth in you, He's talking about the Spirit. And he need not that any man teach you. you know, that, is, that, isn't a, that isn't a ticket for you to skip out in church. That's not what he's saying here. That's not what he's saying at all. He's just saying that you have the Spirit of God in you to give you the wisdom and the understanding that you need. You have not that any man teach you. Watch this. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things in his truth. And there is no lie that even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. You know, so, <clears throat> back to this again, back to this again, he says to these uh, believers at, at Ephesus, he said, You're not so long, Christ. He said, Look, this isn't the way you've been taught to live like that. He says, But you've been taught by Jesus Christ himself. I don't think that will further because there's more. I think that you need to understand in the midst of all of this. When we get saved, when, when you got saved, <laughs> I got a dry in so my friend Baltimore is going to put a bottle of water in front of it. We'll get through it here. Uh, the feathers don't fly out after a while. Uh, but listen, 
when you got saved, you were you came under grace. You were saved. You were saved by grace through faith. And there are a lot of facets to the grace. A lot of facets. That grace keeps you saved. That it is by grace that you are saved. That's how Mary did say it. It is grace that keeps you saved. Also, but listen to this. It is by grace that you are also taught by the Spirit of God living inside of each and every one of us. I'm going to show you that, but let me, let me walk you through something here. Watch Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Okay? We are no longer, we are not by any means under the law. I'm not coming down the area, but I'm going to get a bottle of water. Thank you very much. Oh, that's much better. Okay, so, so we're not under law, but we're not under grace. Okay, so let me, let me touch you on something. So we don't need the law to teach us how to live, how to live more lives. A lot of people want to bring the law into the church and they want to mix it with grace. But if we don't do that, because we're, we're uh, in Christ, we're dead to the law. And Christ is the end of the law. Uh, so we don't, you don't need God's law to teach you uh, the, the moral statutes of God. You don't need that. Grace does that. Let me show you that. Let me show you this. Titus 2, 11 through 15. Now watch this. For the grace of God that bring us salvation and the fear to all men. Watch verse 12. Here it comes. Teaching us. What's teaching us? It is grace that teaches us. What it is teaching us, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. A fear looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all of it, but he purified himself of peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Let me get one more break. I'm going to get my break on this moment. Verse 12 again. It is grace that teaches us and instructs us. So, okay, so there's a, there are many facets of grace. So it is by grace you are saved through faith. It is by grace that we are kept saved. And it is by grace that the Spirit of God works inside of you and I and teaches to each and every one of us. He instructs us. And that's the idea. I don't want to take it a long way right here. But, but that is the idea in the midst of this. That we are taught by Jesus Christ himself through the Spirit. So nobody can say, well, you know what, I don't know. I don't know if I'm supposed to do that. Yeah, you do. Because when you get out of line, the Spirit of God is going to convict you, and, and, and the Spirit of God is going to chasten you, so you know when you get out of line. You know that. And so we have this, we have this, uh, this function, this anointing, this teacher that lives inside of us, and he teaches and instructs us. And I guarantee you, whenever he instructs us, he doesn't instruct us to go back to the old life. That's what Paul said. He said, you've not learned, so learn Christ. He said, that's not what we learned. You get away from that old life. And I told you last week, there's that danger, because you and I have the sin nature. There's that danger, because the sin nature likes the old way that we used to live, and, and the old desire to go back into getting involved in things that you used to be involved in, before you were saved, that happens to many, many people. That happens to many people. There's a lot of warnings in all of that. One thing is this, and we have to be careful who we hang out with. Last week, I talked to you, and, and we looked at this on Sunday nights, that when Israel left Egypt, they took with them a mixed multitude. A major mistake. A major mistake. Because it wasn't long after they were gone that the mixed multitude and they became, they ate the man, and they said, we don't like this man. 
You remember what it was like back in Egypt when we had all those vegetables and we had everything to eat back there. And here we are. All we got is this manna. Well, that manna is a picture of the Word of God. And so what happens is this. And then you start hanging out with the same people. And you're supposed to be feeding on the Word of God. And they start to long after the things of, of the old life because that's what the mixed multitude did. They longed after the things of the old life. And what happened was that pool, that when they started to complain, Israel got caught up in it. They said, yeah, I worked harder than they had to. And it brought a, a, a terrible judgment upon them. Many of them died for that very reason. And I share all that to say this, that you and I got to be very careful about, about Getting, I'll say, getting exposed to what we came out of. I remember reading that story years ago about a little girl that fell out of bed in the middle of the night. They were a little hard to thump, but she went over and the little girl was on the floor getting up, and her mom said, What happened? And she said, I guess I stayed too close to where I got in. That's what happens to a lot of believers. Instead of moving on, they stay too close to where they got in. And so all of these habits of the old life, boy, they're really appealing. They're really appealing to the flesh. And, and so the next thing you know, somebody says, well, I just get up and I just a little bit. I just, I just try it out just a little bit. And the next thing you know, you're in the back. And then it becomes a part of your life. And, and I guarantee you, this is a believer. You hate it. You want to come free, you want to come free, and you want to be away from it, and so you struggle and you strive and you give it up for a while, and you think, well, I've got away from that. The next thing you know, you turn around and you fall right back into it again. And then you feel miserable, and then you get up and you say, I'm not going to do that again, and you mark the calendar. This is the last bit that I'm going to get involved in that. Then you go for a little bit, the next thing you know, guess what? Bang, 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 about three days in a row, you fall right back into it. And there you are. And you decide, how do I how do I get away from this? How do I break these chains? How do I get away from this habit that I have, whatever that habit might be? How do I get away from that? And my life that brings us down. So we're gonna look at now what uh what's if you put verse twenty two, we read twenty two through twenty four and we'll gather these together. Now let me read 20 to 24 because if you need to flow. Verse 20 says, But you have not so known Christ. You're so mean that you have heard of him and been taught by him. That's the truth is in Jesus. Okay, now here it comes to what we're taught. That you put off concerning the former conversation. That word conversation there means lifestyle. Put off the former lifestyle, the old man. Which is corrupt according to the deceitful laws, so be renewed in the spirit of your mind. But you put on the big man, which is the God is created in righteousness and true holiness. The old man here, let me clarify a few things. The old man that Paul's talking about here is the sin nature, the flesh. The old man. The new man will be the new creation. Uh, the divine nature that we have. I'll show you that. Uh, Second Corinthians 5 17. You know, words, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. The old, all things are become new. So let me get you back to this. Okay, so Jesus, what Paul's saying is Jesus teaches you, and then he goes into verse 22 and he tells you what he teaches, and what he teaches is this that we are to lay aside the old man like an old garment. And we are to put on a new man. He doesn't tell us to clean up the old garment. He doesn't tell you to clean up the old man. That, that's not what he says. The idea here is that the old man has been stripped of his power. And, and so, therefore, we don't have to follow them anymore. We, don't, we, are no, we no longer need to be under the control of the, of the flesh. Before salvation, you didn't have a choice. You didn't have a choice. Your sin nature controlled you. He was the one that sat on the throne in your heart and 
you didn't have a choice, you sinned, you couldn't produce any righteousness whatsoever in your life, and by any means, no matter how hard you tried, because you were under, you were enslaved to sin, and you were under the authority of the old man, the sin nature. Let me give you a little glimpse of that, okay? We look at it in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Talking about our past. If you have to quicken who were gained in trespasses and sins, right in time past, so much as you walked according to the course of this world, that's the philosophies of the world, the flow of the philosophies, they didn't have so much influence on us. According to the prince of the power of the air, Satan had influence on us. The spirit that now work within the children of disobedience, not only Satan, but his demonic forces had tremendous influence over us, verse 3. Among them also, we all had our conversation in time past, and it comes in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the mind that we're by children of, of the by nature of the children of wrath, even as others. So, okay, in the, in the past, this is where we were, and we were controlled by the old sin nature. But now it's different. I want you to listen to this. This is the key to freedom in Christ, the liberty in Christ. Now, the old man, when you got saved, he got stripped of his power. He got stripped. You don't have to follow him anymore. Because he's been rendered powerless. We have to show you what Paul said in Romans 6. Now watch these verses. 6, 4, through 7, and verse 18. It says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. The light as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we should walk in newness of life. See, that is the idea. We don't live verses 17 through 19 anymore. We walk in newness of life. We put off the old man. We get rid of that old garment and we put on a, a brand new garment, which is the righteousness of God. And, and, and we walk in His righteousness. Okay, so, so we can bury with Him in baptism and, and, and by baptism into death. And just like Christ was raised, so we were raised. Okay, let's go on. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, and we have, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, verse 6 is the key. Watch it. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin. I'm just saying, on. When, when you got saved, you were crucified with Christ. You were crucified with Jesus Christ. And when you were crucified with Jesus Christ, the power was stripped from your sin nature. That's for sense that the body of sin might be destroyed by your powerless. And henceforth, watch this, henceforth, from that day forward that we are saying, we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin, being made free from sin, he became the servants of righteousness. Okay, now listen to me. Our sin nature was made powerless by the cross. There are Christians who go through life, and they go through that struggle, and it's called Romans 7 struggle. What you want to do, you don't do. What you don't want to do, you do. And there may be some of you here today, and you're going to do that in your life. If so, it's an ongoing battle. It's an ongoing battle. Just like I said, you say, you know what, I'm not going to do that anymore. And it goes back to the part of you staying too close to where you got in. But anyhow, that's not that bad. It is what it is now. And so you're involved in that. And so you have this habit in your life. And you want free from that habit so bad that you want free from it. You just want to get away from it. You hate the fact that it exists in your life. And so, like I said, you said I'm not going to do it anymore. And you do everything you can. Only you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and, and you get your mind set up, determined I'm going to be I'm going to be disciplined in this. And I'm not going back to that scene anymore. And they say, you know, you're right, I can't. And you repeat it over and over 
mean, that pattern goes on, that pattern goes on. Maybe it's been going on for years. And you're saying to yourself, boy, oh boy, is there any hope for me? Yeah. Yeah. The problem is that the battle's already been won. You just don't understand how it's been won. You've not been taught. In fact, I want you to listen to this. The innocent nature was defeated at the cross. And it's only the cross that he will bow to. Understand that? Only the cross. The cross is what takes his power away. You can't bludgeon him into submission. You know, nobody can make up the law. Churches make up the rules. They make up rules. They come up with this whole list of rules. This is the way you've got to live. You're going to do this, 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 and this. This is what you're going to do. And that's not anybody that keeps the list. They might, they might pretend like they do, but they don't. Because it's not a list of rules that is going to change your life. It's not a list of rules that is going to, that's going to get you free from that, whatever that sin is, that the same sin that you are battling with. There's only one thing that will set you free, and that's the cross. That's it. That's the only thing that the sin nature will ever bow to. And it's the cross. And that's exactly what Paul's saying in verse 6. He's not like this, that old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, might be rendered powerless. So you say, okay, so you teach me that, 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 by, that by the cross, my old nature is stripped of his power? What am I going to do? So I know that now. So what am I going to do? So you are going to do this. Romans 6, 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed in the sin of the law of the God of Jesus Christ. I want to believe it. Believe it. That's what you're supposed to do. Believe that your old sin nature was stripped of its power at the cross when you were crucified with Christ. And, and so, therefore, you don't have to obey it anymore. Now there is a new master in your life. Before you had one commander. You had the sin nature, you had the flesh, and he led you and me by the, by the nose wherever he wanted us to go. And he deceived me with the lust. He said, if you did this, then you're going to be content. If you go over here, you're going to be content. If you get involved in this, if you get your name here, you boy, this will be great for you. This is where you'd be, and boy, you'll be sitting right on top of the world. And so you drive, and you strive, and you get there, and you lie to you. It's all deception. You have no choice, because you're following wherever he led you. But it's not so today. It's not so today. You know Christ the Savior, you've got a new commandment. And who he is is the Spirit of God living in you. That's who wants to control your life. That's who wants me if you want to let's, let's say we're, let's say, uh, say we're crossing an ocean on a ship. And we got a, we got a commander that's an evil individual. He's very, very evil. So he, he just, he works us to death as we're on the ship going across the, the ocean and then in the middle of the journey, somebody rises up that's more powerful than him and overthrows him and takes him and locks him in a cage on the, on the, in the ship. And, and so here he sits, he's over here and he's in this cage while we're going across the ocean. And now we have this new commander, and this new commander says, this is the way we're going to do things. This is how it's going to be done. And, then, and, and he loves us, and he treats us great. And so now you've got a choice. Over here is the old one, and he's in the cage, and he's yelling out to you, and he's trying to tell you what to do. You've got a choice you can listen to. This one's locked up. You have a choice which one you're going to listen to. That's exactly where we are in our Christian lives. The sin nature is still alive. But I don't have to listen to it. Because he's been stripped of his power. It's my responsibility to reckon myself to be dead under sin, to believe that, that I was crucified with Christ and he got stripped of his power then. And so whenever I believe that, listen, 
but I believe that Jesus died for me. Listen to this. Then my life was changed when I believed he died, was buried, and rose again for me. I was saved. And it changed my life. If you believe that your, that your sin nature was crucified with Christ, I guarantee you it will change your life. That's the key to getting free from that sin that drags you down, that wants to pull you back into all of this old stuff that you were in. Maybe not all of it, just one thing. But just one thing, and it's pulled you right back in. And it's just, boy, it's a pain, and you want to get free from it so much. You come in here some mornings, and you put a smile plastered on your face, but inside your heart's broken. Because what you want to do, you don't do. And what you don't want to do, you do. Right there is the key. When I just went through that, and it's not from me, it's from God's Word. That's the way to be free. Put off the old man, put on the new. Remember, you just keep in your mind that you're all that shit, and the old man's in the cage. He's going to yell out at you. Hey, let's go over here. Let's do it this way. Let's go get involved in that. If you had that, then you'd be happy in your life. Just tell him to shut up. Don't listen to him. You don't have to listen to him anymore. You don't have to bow to him anymore. Follow the Spirit of God. Put on a new man. Let the Spirit of God control you. Let me bring you back here. Flip my watch. 22 and 23. Again, I'm not. I'll show you uh, two things that we need to put off and go along with the old man. Verse 22. To put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. First thing is that we are to put off following deceitful lusts. You know, he's been trying, the old man's been trying to talk him into that. You don't have to follow that. You don't go along with that anymore. Deceitful lies are exactly what they are deceitful. So, what, what, what it'll be is this that the flesh will try to convince you that you can be content and satisfied if you get involved in this or you get involved in that. If you go back, remember what you used to do before you were saying, just get over that just a little bit. What if you just say it that one more time? And somebody tries to convince you. That will bring some kind of contentment. But the problem I'm telling you won't be some lasting value. First John 2, 15 through 17 says, No, not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not even for all that is in the world, watch this. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, be careful, be careful with you. Cast your stare upon. Because you look long enough, then you begin to decide that never came to deny that it should have been a poor lady was out on the on the roof top and that she was going to the wall. They did. The lust of the eyes and the pride of life. You know that you know that one would if if I had a guess that everybody would really think I'm something that pride of life still a lot of people were in trouble before. All third of John says is it's not of the Father, but it is of the world. It's in the world passes away, and the lust thereof, it's all going to go away. It doesn't amount to anything. And it's so lasting, but it's so deceptive, and so, it'll leave you so empty. And you guys want to say, but he did do it for little God by the forever. So, we got to, we got to stop following after the sinful lust. Keep that old man in the cage. Say, you know, I'm not listening to you anymore. I'm done with you. Another one that's very important is the old way of thinking. Watch verse 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Our, our way of thinking needs to change. So the old thoughts, the old ways need to be put off. That requires a self discipline by the way. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, also this testing down imaginations and every high thing that exalt itself against the knowledge of God and bringing bring in the captivity of the thought to the obedience of Christ. That's what we have to do. You have to recognize when those thoughts come that shouldn't be there. And 
God said, listen to me, that's how sin starts. That's where the conception takes place. It starts in the mind when you put the thoughts. So let me show you uh, what the Bible says about the sin of man's thoughts. So there's a lot of verses. This is just a few of them. Proverbs 15, 26 says, The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. The thoughts, God even knows the thoughts. And the words of the pure are pleasant words. Isaiah 55, 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thought to let him return unto the Lord. They will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon him. And Isaiah 59, 4 and 7, Not call for justice, nor any plaintiff for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. Their feet run away when they make haste to, to shed in us again. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction, or in your paths. So my thoughts, i got to be careful with my thoughts. i gotta, I got to learn to think differently. I have to, I have to train myself to think differently, and I, and I have to be careful where I allow my thoughts to go. It's so very important. And when those thoughts come up, that should not be there. And we have the same nature. So what happens? We got to cast them down. Or anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, we got to bring them into captivity. And we got to get rid of it. We can't let our minds go there. Because once you start, once that thought gets in and you allow it to stay, listen, uh, James tells us that there is a conception that takes place. And once a conception takes place, there's going to be a baby that is born and the baby is sin. And so if you, you have these thoughts and you're going to get rid of them, refuse to stay focused on that. You say, well, how in the world would I ever do that? I mean, so let me give you uh, something I think that will help you. Hebrews 4 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharp and a two edged sword. Piercing the things that are hiding in some girl's soul and spirit in the joints and marrow. It is the discerner of the thoughts. Watch out. It's the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Your way of thinking is changed by what you put in your mind. To be able to put whatever you put in, that's what you're going to think. So we have to learn to fill our minds. With that which is pure and righteous. And I want to bless you about the Philippians and Paul Lewis to think on these things. And thought that the verse just comes to my mind now, but we have to think on things that are pure. That's where our focus needs to be. Be careful with that word. We're bombarded daily with immoral things. There's a radio, they come in, they pay on whatever you listen to, the uh, commercials, TV, billboards, uh, whatever it might be. You're just bombarded every single day. So uh, we need to fill our minds with God's Word because God's Word is the center of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So what you put in is going to control how you think. So we need to be putting things in that are pure, that are holy. And it gets you to a conclusion. Two things I believe that are required of us in the midst of all of this. Number one would be this we have to abide in Christ. If He's the one that teaches us, then we've got to stay very close to Him. We've got to abide in Him. We've got to walk in fellowship with Him. John 15, 4 through 8 says this. Watch how many times the word abide is used here. Abiding in the eye of is the branch in a bare fruit of itself, except that abiding the vine. No more can except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branch, you see that abideth in me, and I am the same branch for much fruit. For without me, can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is one that can make rather than casting into the fire, and there are arms. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. And as my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so say to be my disciples, abiding in Christ, walking in fellowship with our Lord. That's what is needed. So we need to be close to Him, close to the teacher, so that 
started to realize what you're reading and you started to follow along in the story, starting in the gospel, starting in the gospel of John, and started to read, and then you start to see the events begin to unfold, and then the next thing you know, uh, 15, 20 minutes, a half hour, 45 minutes goes by, and you've read through maybe 10 or 12 chapters. But you're excited, and there's something else that you want to read about. Lost it. Lost it. Because of all of the things that are crammed into our lives. If you've got to make an adjustment, make it. But we need that time in God's Word. We need that. We need that time to abide in Him and talk to Him and listen to what He's going to say because He's the one who teaches us. Let's pray. Father, we. We thank you, Father, for the Spirit of God that does live within us, teaches us, teaches us Christ. It's his desire to manifest Christ in our lives. Father, forgive us because we have all got caught up in that chaos of life. The busyness of life. I have to get this done. I have to do this. If I'm not here, then something's wrong. If I'm, if I'm out of touch with people, then something might go wrong. I got this to remember that years ago we didn't have all of this. Life will work just fine. God, I know maybe somebody here today and we're going to struggle with that the setting soon. Bring the message to us, help them to understand that the old man's locked up in the cage and they don't have to listen to him anymore. The woman has been stripped of the strength of his power. There's a new captain. That's the Spirit of God that wants to lead him. So we help them to let themselves 